as we as we remain standing, let me lead us in a prayer. Father, full of thankful hearts as we are for your Son, the Lord Jesus, we pray now that you would quieten our hearts and speak to us by your Spirit through your living words. Open our eyes so we might see the fields that are ripe for harvest. We ask that in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, please do sit down. It is lovely to be with you this morning. And if you were able to open up your Bibles and turn back to John chapter 3, which we had read to us uh, so well, we're going to look, look mainly at verses 16 and 17, but I'm grateful for the whole uh, passage being read. Uh, after Her Majesty's funeral tomorrow, uh, I was listening to the radio this morning, they're saying it will be politics back uh, on the front pages of our newspapers, and uh, uh, Liz Truss, the, the new Prime Minister, will be starting uh, whatever she's going to start with a bang this week. And if you cast your mind back to uh, the leadership election for the Conservative Party, I think uh, what went wrong for Boris Johnson was the question, could he be trusted? Could the country trust him? Uh, could uh, we believe what he said to be true? And it all down to his character. Well, this morning, we're going to consider whether the God of the Bible is trustworthy. Uh, as we consider God's mission, you and I need to be clear in our minds and convinced in our hearts who the God of the Bible is, that God is trustworthy. For mission, be that in this country or overseas, flows from the character of God. It flows from who God is. Now the word mission, you'll know, is derived from a little Latin word called missio, which means sent. And here in John's Gospel, we see that as Jesus is sent from God the Father to bring salvation to the world, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. So he then sends his disciples, all of his followers, you and I, if we know and love him this morning, out into the world to share this life giving news. So right at the end, John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And Crosslinks, the Anglican Mission Society I work for, we are in this business of helping local churches like yours send some of their very best people overseas, both short term, ending from a couple of weeks up to three years, or long term for a whole lifetime to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Chris and uh, Rosie are a couple in their late 20s with uh, Lydia, their young daughter, she's about one now, and they went just after Easter to relocate from the northeast of England from Newcastle out to Valencia in Spain. And they've gone to, to Valencia to work with some other crossing mission partners in the Anglican Church there um, and to reach this vastly secular but culturally Roman Catholic uh, country, this, this city of Valencia. Now, Chris and Rosie are leaving behind their caring yet aging parents. They've left behind stable jobs, a lovely home, uh, the comfort of the NHS, and a fairly guaranteed future. Now, what has possessed Chris and Rosie to do that? Chris and Rosie needed to be absolutely convinced of who the God of the Bible is, that he's entirely good, and that he is entirely trustworthy. And that's what we're going to do this morning as we consider some of the most famous and well-known verses in the whole of the Bible, verse 16 and 17, set as they are between uh, this meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus. I saw on the back of the service sheets there's space for notes. Uh, that's always really encouraging when you go to a church. The problem is in most churches, people have forgotten a pen to write the notes with. I'm sure that's not the case here. But I've got four truths that I want to share with you this morning from this verse that I trust will convince you that God is good and he's trustworthy and therefore one whose mission is worth getting on board for. So first truth, the missionary God we see is a loving God. We read verse 16, for God so loved the world. Now it's really tempting to put ourselves as uh, the subject of the verse, but God is the primary subject here as we read of his mission and particularly of his motive 
for mission. God is love. And therefore, God's mission isn't coming from some um, arbitrary dictator with sort of warped motives, but from a good God who longs to save and rescue a broken and rebellious world. Now, Nicodemus, you'll know, uh, who we read of at the start of the chapter, he's clearly been intrigued by Jesus. He recognised something of who Jesus was, verse 3, but maybe he'd heard of the water being turned into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, or, or maybe he'd heard of the authority that Jesus proclaimed as he cleared the temple precincts back in chapter 2. Yet what Nicodemus, the religious expert, might not have been clear on is that God's mission for reaching out to this world, revealed through sending his son Jesus, is entirely motivated by love. Now, Chatsworth House, uh, which is not too far from here, is one of the finest, grandest houses in all of Britain. Uh, it was used as the film location for Pemberley in the 2005 film adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. And in the garden, you'll know if you've been there, is this huge cascading fountain which runs all the way down the hillside in a series of steps. The, wa the water flows from one step to another. And I think that's a really good image of God's love. The Father is the fountain of life and love, and his life and love fill the Son and overflow through the Son to the world. And that love overflows to his people, and through his people, it keeps flowing out into a very needy world. Which is extraordinary, isn't it? Because this uh, world, when you consider it, can be pretty unlovely and fairly unlovable. Parts of this world are lovely. Some people are lovely, but sadly, people, you and I, often we are not unlovely. <laughs> we're not lovely, we're unlovely. And for all the examples of sort of unloveliness that we can point at down through history, or we read of in our newspapers. As we've taught our children, for every finger we point out there, there are three fingers pointing back at us. This world is broken. Our lives are messed up. Our sin is an offence against God, and it damages and it hurts other people. But have a look down to verse 17, because this is where, what, what makes the Christian gospel extraordinary. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God's mission, motivated by love, is to rescue rather than to ruin people. The missionary God is a God of love. And therefore, if you're here this morning feeling rather lacking in love, uh, either for God or for the people either side of you, uh, or for, for mission, and getting, getting on board with what this church is doing and what God is doing through this church here, but also overseas. It's not just the case of sort of screwing up your face and trying a bit harder to conjure up a feeling of love. The solution to any loveless, lovelessness in our hearts is to sit under the cascading fountain of God the Father's unfailing love. A love that flows to us from the Father through the Son, by his spirit. The place we need to be, if we want to be a mission-minded individual or a mission-committed church, is getting drenched in God's love until that love flows out through us to a needy world. So first we see the missionary God is a loving God. Second we see in our verse, the missionary God is a generous God. So have a look at our verse again, if you would. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's always lovely to come to a church that's got uh, children in it. Um, Christmas, we know, is a very special time for all people, but especially children. It's a time for giving gifts. Uh, and imagine Christmas, though. Uh, we're trying to get through Christmas and children uh, if we were not to give presents. Imagine if you were to invite your grandchildren or children or nephews and nieces to Christmas at this house, at your house. And you said, uh, guys, this year we're not going to give presents. Well, that would be uh, absurd, wouldn't it? It wouldn't make sense to them. And so the love of the missionary God reveals itself most fully in the gift of his son. Start of verse 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, the conversation back in the chapter between Nicodemus and Jesus 
uh, hasn't been going overly well in verses 3 to 8. There's lots of crossed wires, there's lots of confusion. To which Nicodemus asks in verse 9, have a look at it, for further clarification. So what Jesus does is he appeals to the Old Testament. Very clever, Jesus. He appeals to the Old Testament, he's speaking to a Jewish, a member of the Jewish ruling council who'd have known his Old Testament really well. And he says these words from verse 12. He says, look, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Because Jesus has been sent from the Father, that's what verse 13 is speaking of, he has God's authority to speak. And the best way, the best teacher the world has ever known uh, to communicate uh, is to uh, and explain the reason for his coming to this world, is to retell this story of the bronze snake uh, on Moses' staff. Do you remember that from your days in Sunday school, mm -hmm. back there in uh, Numbers chapter 21? You might remember life has not been going well for Israel. They were grumbling against God. They were doubting his goodness. They were in full-blown rebellion. Yet despite of this, despite of this arrogance and behaviour, God generously provided for them a means of rescue for his people. God displayed his grace to his wayward people. He offered them something they didn't deserve and which they could never achieve. God told his servant to put on his staff a bronze snake that, so that whoever looks at it in faith would live. The Israelites needed to take God at his word and believe that when they, he said, look at the snake and live, he would save them from death. So what Jesus does is he reminds Nicodemus of this true story of God's incredible provision to a rebellious people. And Jesus was saying, do you see, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake, so he, the Son of Man, would be lifted up, uh, so that all that who looked at him in faith would live. And that is the generosity of God. God gave. I recently came across a story of uh, an adopted girl in the States who, who belonged to a family who clearly had issues because they wouldn't take her on holiday with them to Disneyland when, as a family, they were going there on holiday. Their adopted daughter, would be left at home and looked after by others whilst the rest of the family went and enjoyed themselves. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Now, in the end, that adopted little girl had to leave that family and she eventually settled with a new family who again promised to take her to Disneyland. However, the closer the family got to the trip, the worse the little girl's behaviour became. And finally, her parents realised it was because of the experience she'd gone through with that previous family. And she never really thought that she'd make it on the trip to Disneyland. Now, the, the easiest response from the father uh, to her would have been this. He could have said, look, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But instead, he said these words, is this trip something we're doing as a family? Well, you're coming with us. The girl's behavior didn't improve, in fact it got worse, but finally the time for the trip came. And in a hotel room, after a full-on day of Disney action, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, she was pensive, she was a little weepy at times, but this, this month-long facade of rebellion had faded away. And when bedtime came around, the father asked her, so how was your first day at Disneyland? And she said these words, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disneyland, but it wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. And that girl experienced grace for the first time, the generous, undeserved love of a father. And that is a small picture a very small picture of God the Father's love for wayward people like all of us here in this room this morning. The mission partners who Crosslinks uh, help to facilitate go overseas, they are far from perfect people. However, they are all people who get grace. 
And for a church to be truly mission-minded, we too must get grace. For grace enables us to be generous, to be sacrificial, to be committed. So the second truth to see is the missionary God is a generous God. Thirdly, we see here, the missionary God is an inclusive God. He is an inclusive God. Let me read from verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him. Do you see, God's offer of grace, which leads to eternal life, it is made to whoever believes. So it's no wonder, I suppose, that the, the two people that Jesus encounters either side of verse 16 here could not be more different. Let me explain. So Nicodemus was, was male, he was respectable, <laughs> he was a member of the religious ruling elite. He, he truly was an establishment figure, religiously orthodox. Um, he was the MP without the scandal. He was the bishop without the blemish. Uh, he was the businessman whose dealings were unimpeachable. Now, in chapter 4, after this passage, we've got the opposite end of the spectrum. So we've got a, a morally compromised, and I do mean a seriously morally compromised woman. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 18, if you need to be convinced of that. And she is a despised Samaritan woman. She's got nothing to offer. That The scent of scandal, the scars of shame are all over her. She was despised. And so, what, so either side of what commentators have described as the greatest summary text in all the Bible, we get living, breathing proofs that the God of the Bible is for all sorts of people. Now, the word inclusive has been hijacked by some people and by some churches in the Church of England to mean something completely different. So let's be really clear. God's grace is available to all people. Yet God's grace never leaves us where it finds us. And as a person puts their trust in Christ, as they receive his grace to forgive their sins, as a, that person, in response and in gratitude to that grace, they seek to live for him and no longer for themselves. <laughs> and so friends, the mission of God, we must know, is, is a God for all people. He's not a, good, he's not a God just for middle-class, white, respectable people. He is for all people, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, English, even the Scottish and the Welsh. You get the picture. He is, he is for all people. I, I'm safe to say that because we're in Derbyshire. Um, now, William Carey was the father of modern missions, and he devoted his life in the 18th and 19th centuries to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in India. And this is how one person described William Carey's attitude to that amazing country. He said, William Carey saw India not as a foreign country to be exploited, but as his heavenly father's land to be loved and served. A society where truth, not ignorance, needed to rule. Now, I spent some uh, time in India a few years ago, and what is extraordinary about India is how divided that nation still is. The caste system, the segregation, uh, it's extraordinary. And yet I was privileged to, to be working in a church where people from all parts of Indian society gathered as God's family. And that is what the gospel offers. Because the missionary God is a loving God, he's a generous God, and he is an inclusive God. But fourthly and finally, we've almost finished, verse 16, we mustn't miss out on this. We see finally the missionary God is a risen and ruling God. Let me just read verse 16 one final time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. History um, is linear. That is to say, it had a beginning and it will have an end. Now, now Eastern religions promote a notion of reincarnation, where the circle of life and death just roll on and roll into each other. Whereas Jesus was very clear, he, he said that he would one day return to this earth, the earth he created, the earth he died for, the earth he will one day judge. And his return, or before that, if we reach the end of our days here on earth, that puts perspective on all of our lives. 
Now, at this point, we've got no idea how Nicodemus uh, responds to Jesus, what he's thinking about this. Yeah, do you know when Nicodemus pops up again in John's Gospel? It's towards the end of chapter 19. Uh, and he would have been very much confronted with the matter of eternity then. Because in chapter 19, along with Joseph of Arimathea, he went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he helped his friend with that mix of myrrh and aloes to embalm, and they laid their friend, uh, his body, to rest. And yet that story doesn't end with the events of Good Friday. It begins with the events of Easter Sunday. Jesus rose to eternal life. And because of that, we can know the missionary God is a risen and therefore a ruling and reigning God. And verse 16 contains this word, which is tremendously vivid, and it's the word perish. It's a word that's very plain speaking. I bet people in this part of the world are plain speaking. You know, when fruit in your fruit bowl perishes, it very visibly engages in the process of decay and death. And God, as he often does in the Bible, speaks in a way that couldn't be plainer here. The choice before all people is stark. For those who will believe in Jesus, they will share with Jesus that eternal life that Christ won for them through his death and resurrection. And that is why, despite of the sadness of Her Majesty the Queen leaving us, this is a time for Christian people not to grieve without hope because she was clearly a woman who loved Jesus as her Lord and Saviour. But the alternative, for those who won't believe in Jesus, the alternative is death. And this is why verse 16 cannot be skipped over, and it is an eternal punishment that will last a lifetime, separation from God and his goodness for all time. A punishment that is so awful that it took the most extreme lengths to avoid it the one and only Son of God dying for sins on the cross. Now, many years ago, I used to to be in the British Army, and I served there for five or six years. And we did a lot of training uh, down in Salisbury Plain. And there's lots of footpaths, public footpaths across Salisbury Plain. You can take your dog for a walk on a Sunday afternoon. uh, And yet you'll come across these yellow signs that are fluttering in the wind, which declare very cheerfully, danger of death, unexploded (laughs) ordnance. Now that's not a very cheery sign to explain to children on a Sunday afternoon walk, but it's a very kind necessity to do so. It's warning of the dangers to avoid. And friends, John 3.16 ends with this warning. Our friends and our neighbours, our work colleagues and family members, the people of this village and the nearby towns and cities, we all have a decision to make. We won't live forever. And the passing of the Queen is a time for reflection. Having gone through a global pandemic, this has been brought home to many of us. We will not live forever. And one day we will meet with the God who made us. And because he is a risen and ruling God, he has done all that is necessary so that we need not be afraid of that meeting. You see, God's mission to a broken world flows from who he is. We can trust the God of the Bible. So as a church, will you pray for God's mission? Will you give to God's mission? Maybe some of you might go. Because God is trustworthy. He is loving, he is generous, he is inclusive, and he reigns over this world today. Let me lead us in a short prayer as I close. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord God, that your Son, the Lord Jesus, is risen and reigning today, and that all those who look to him in faith will not perish. Help us, we pray, to play our part in taking the wonderful news of your love this broken and very needy world. We pray that for your glory. Amen. Amen.